Hello and welcome to another video. We're going to be talking about pinning dependencies in Python stuff, although I guess this technically applies to any language. Uh, I'm going to give you my opinions on this as well as why I do what I do. And yeah, let's jump into it. Okay, so first we're going to start by talking about libraries. When I talk about a library here, this is something that someone else is installing to provide functionality. Um, and I'm making that ex very distinct from an application, which is something that I would be deploying to production. Um, thinking like, you know, my uh, startup has a microservice that has dependencies. I'm going to deploy that chunk of code as an application. I'm not thinking of that as a library. Uh, generally, when I think about libraries for Python, I'm thinking about things that I'm putting onto PyPI. Uh, and so let's start by talking about libraries first, since I think they are the more controversial part and the uh, more complicated part. Uh, I've pulled down pregament here, since it's one of the few things that I have that actually has dependencies. And I'm going to use this as the example for uh, what I'm describing in the dependencies situation. Now, pregament is a li library. It's technically a tool that's more like an application, but it's installed alongside lots and lots of other things, and so it's more useful to think of it as a library than anything else. Uh, it specifies its uh, runtime dependencies in setup.cfg. You, know, you might also put this in setup.py or other files. And you'll notice here that all of the dependencies that I've listed are very much just greater than or equal to. Uh, there is no equals equals here, there is no less than, there is nothing else. And this is what I recommend for libraries, is to set a lower bound for your dependencies and use greater than or equal to after that. Now you might say, oh Anthony, but config v is probably going to you know, make a breaking change at some point, and so you know, you might, it might be a good idea to do less than 3 here because you know, the, the future version of config v might break something. Uh, and, you know, that is a conservative way to approach dependencies. However, I like to take the charitable interpretation that even after a breaking change, for the most common use case of a library, it's likely to not break it. And I think, in, in fact, for example, I think config v is already on uh, a later version than version 3. Uh, oh, no, it's my own personal library, right? I believe it is past version 3. And is the uh, oh, setup.cfg, what is the latest version? Yeah, it's on version 3.3.1. Uh, and if I would have done less than 3 here, I would have had to go around to everything that depended on config v after the, the major version bump and update it. Not only would I have to update it, but the less than would have caused conflicts for other people that were using my library. You know, maybe they need the functionality that's available in version 3.0, um, but Precommit was fine with whatever version that was available. If I had specified less than three, then they couldn't use my library with the new functionality. So it's unnecessarily restrictive. Uh, so I tend to, you know, not do not do any major or minor pinning, just straight greater than or equal to. Uh, occasionally, this causes problems. Occasionally, a library will introduce a breaking change, and the response to that should not be a less than. Uh, well, in some cases it is. Like if the, if the library makes an intentional breaking change and you have no intentions of upgrading, then yes, a less than is an appropriate, uh, appropriate response to that sort of breaking change. Uh, but typically what I usually do is instead use a not equal to. So let's say for instance, when config v 3.0.0 came out and there was some bug in the major release, uh, but I was you know optimistic that it would be fixed in a future version. Instead of doing less than three, uh, which you know would also work, uh, I prefer to use does not equal and then a very specific version with the hope that the future version of the library will fix that bug. Now, uh, you know, it's, it may not fix that bug. You know, this is probably what I would only do if a uh, fix was imminent uh, and it was very important to exclude that version. Um, so I use this sparingly to prevent things like that. Uh, in addition to dependencies, I also use this when specifying Python requires. I see a very common, and it's going to be really annoying if this ever happens, I see a very common uh, pattern of doing less than 4.0 here. And while this is correct today, it's going to be a pain in the ass when Python 4 comes out because <laughs> a lot of code is likely to be compatible, but it's going to be not installable because of this bad practice. 
Uh, I also see people do this today where like they've tested on, oh, well, let's say you know, 311 just came out. So they'll, they'll put 312 as, as their top bound here. And this is also really annoying because when the next minor version of Python comes out, an already released library, even though it probably works just fine on 312, won't be installable because of this bad practice. So I would strongly recommend to never upper bound your Python requires in the same way that I recommend not upper bounding your direct dependencies. Uh, now, the other thing that I should mention here is I'm only listing the dependencies that I directly depend on. So even though um, even though virtualenv depends on uh, like PyLock or PyFileLock or FileLock, I don't remember what it's called. Uh, virtualenv depends on some other libraries. I'm not listing them here. I'm only listing the things that my application directly imports. And uh, you know you can find those pretty quickly by doing you know get grep imports and uh, finding all of the ones that are not first party or third party and you know going from there. Uh, a useful tool that I've written that might help you with this is uh, classify imports. And you can use classify imports to figure out what is first party or third party. Uh, at some point, I want to write a tool that automatically you know prunes your direct dependencies for you, but I've written it twice at companies and lost it to closed source, so maybe one day I'll create an open source version of it. Uh, but for instance, if we do classify imports dot, what is it called? Classify base, and you know you put config v in here, it's going to know that's third party, whereas pre commit it's going to know that's your application import, uh, and you know any sort of standard library is going to be built in. I believe there's also a special case for your future. Anyway, I'm off topic here. I should stop rambling about classify imports. Okay, so to summarize, four libraries. Uh, find the lower bound of, of your dependency, use greater than or equals to, don't use less than, and in infrequent cases, you'll use does not equal to exclude versions. All right, so that's, that's libraries. Now let's talk about applications. Applications are a completely different thing. You have completely different goals for apps. Uh, for apps, you want the state of your repository to represent the state of production. You want it to be as repeatable as possible, and so you want to freeze absolutely everything. Now, even though you want to freeze absolutely everything, and I'm going to use an example of one of the microservices of Pregment CI, even though you want to freeze absolutely everything so that it's repeatable, I find that it's useful to still list your minimal dependencies such that you can later upgrade everything or upgrade particular versions while still knowing what's needed and what's not. And I use a convention that uh, I invented before I realized pip tools was a thing. Uh, my modern recommendation is to use pip tools to manage this. Uh, but the way requirements tools, which is the tool that I wrote, does this is there are two minimal files, a requirements minimal and a requirements dev minimal. Uh, let's actually just show all of those. Uh, be great if I could spell. Okay, there we go. Uh, it uses two minimal files. So the first is requirements dev minimal. These are test dependencies of things that I don't want to deploy to production and also a requirements minimal. These are the list of the libraries that I directly depend on. Uh, this service happens to be pretty simple. So it only depends on one thing here. Now, from these dependencies, I will freeze out all of the, the dependencies and all of their transitive dependencies. This way, a release to PyPI can't break my application because I have locked the versions to a particular set of versions. Now, I would also recommend using hashes. I haven't implemented that in requirements tools, and I'll do that at some point. But uh, for now, I'm, you know, equals equals is good enough. Um, and so you'll see here, I have a minimal file, and that freezes out to all of these dependencies. I don't depend on six directly, but Boto3 pulls in six, and so I should freeze that so that I'm not surprised when you know six 2.0 rolls out and breaks everything. So that that's that's my stance on application. Note here, I'll also freeze my development dependencies as well. This is a little less important. Uh, I really I care more about whether the app runs consistently, and so you know, <laughs> I'm on a really old version of PyTest because I haven't I haven't upgraded this for instance. Uh, so it would be a good idea for me to update this more frequently. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of the difference here. So libraries, greater than or equal to, applications, equals equals. That's kind of the, the summary of everything, uh, as well as my reasons for that. Hopefully you found this useful. If there are additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.